Perfect. So let's just talk about the start of Ripple itself, right? So fundamentally, when Chris Larson and the group started Ripple, what they said is they said, hey, you know, if goods need to move around the world, today we have a container that takes goods from, say, a furniture manufacturer in India to a buyer in Hamburg in Germany. And the container takes that furniture, which is packed in the factory of the supplier, takes it to the buyer and makes sure that during the transport, the friction is minimal. That means damage to the goods is minimal. Whatever is packed from the point A gets delivered safely to point B, right? So that's what container made it possible for physical goods. Physical goods. Now, internet did exactly the same thing for information. Agreed. So let's assume Arjun wants to send an email to Naveen. So what internet protocols do is take that packet of data, take it from Arjun, deliver it to Naveen, totally safely encrypted, in, in generally, and then the delivery is completed. So they move information from point A to point B. Now, what Ripple said is this is true, this is not true about money, right? Mm -hmm. So think about money today is in the same place where post offices, which used to collect information domestically, you would write a letter. And when you wanted to send a letter overseas, it would take more time, it will take more money, right? And then email changed it all. So fundamentally, the founders of Ripple, what we call is as internet of value, wanted to globalize movement of money around the world. That mm -hmm. means Arjun. And here, when I say money, I'm talking about a legal money where a person who's who's authorized to send where money essentially belongs to you or that value belongs to you want to transfer that to Naveen and it should move like an email moves today. That means in a few seconds, you should have a debit in your ledger and Naveen's account should get credited, credited. with exactly the same value. And it should move, move frictionless, seamless, easily, almost at nil cost, and globally people should benefit from it. So that's how Ripple was formed. Okay. And that's the reason our biggest use case and the thing that we focused on was uh, cross-border payments, mm -hmm. and then we can talk about it a little bit more. Okay, and when you say cross-border payments, it's cross-border payments, cross-border remittance, right? So I hear the term Ripple Net, mm -hmm. right? I also hear the term XRP associated with Ripple. So, so staying in that same vein, mm -hmm. Could you explain what is RippleNet yeah. and then also, you know, uh, explain to us what does XRP Absol stand? Absolutely. So let me take a very simple analogy because that's the way it's easier for everybody to understand. So think about Cisco. Mm -hmm. So Cisco is a tech company, right? Now Cisco makes routers, right? And these routers are used by companies around the world. So for example, Arjun may use a router and Naveen may use a routers. Let's call them information nodes because routers are nothing but information nodes, right? And all this technology that Cisco makes and the routers essentially sit on the top of internet, right? Mm -hmm. And internet essentially is the carrier between Arjun and Naveen in this case for information, right? So if we think of Ripple, Ripple is the equivalent of Cisco in this case. Mm -hmm. So it's a tech company which essentially creates software, right? And then routers are nodes. So nodes in the case of RippleNet are banks, financial institutions who decide to particip participate in this money system, right? Okay. So you think of RippleNet as banks, as PSPs, people like MoneyGram, people like Azimo, people like many, many other institutions, Lulu, um, and many other PSPs or banks who decide to participate and become nodes, right? Okay. And then uh, essentially XRP so is- Just one second. So yeah. RippleNet is the network which connects all these nodes. That's right. And that net is run by Ripple. Uh, yeah, so that ran, that network is facilitated by Ripple because okay. essentially the Ripple software essentially runs it. But otherwise, when uh, institute institution A sends information or something of value to institution B, Ripple is not participant to that, right? Okay. So A, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, can send money or information to institution B or C or whatever the case may be, and that's how RippleNet would essentially work. So okay. the transactions are peer-to-peer, -peer, but of course the software that is running both A and B is is, is proprietary or is uh, has been created by Ripple by as Ripple. a tech company, Okay. right? And then of course, like the internet, blockchain is the internet equivalent, which is the system for money, and XRP is one of 
the assets like Bitcoin, like Ethereum that rides on the top of it. It's a public chain, right? So it's not proprietary to Ripple. But what we do is when we send cross-border payments, right? So when an institution A sends cross-border payments to institution B, like today we use US dollar. So to give you an example, when GBP moves into Philippines peso, GBP gets, um, gets uh, converted to US dollar. US dollar. US dollar gets converted to Philippines peso. Exactly in this case, GBP gets converted to XRP, XRP into Philippines peso, but XRP is taken from the public chain, right? But you could do exactly the same thing with GBP into Ethereum, into Philippines peso, GBP into USDC, into Philippines peso. The reason XRP is used is because it's most suitable for payments, because it takes two to three seconds, it's extremely fast, and it's uniquely suited for a cross-border payment. Okay. 